IS 2017. This is the first of the lectures of this year. And uh, before I introduce Christine, we'll actually give the word to, uh, to Eric, our rector, which will then introduce Marty, and then I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> And eventually we'll get to why we're all here to hear Christine once the rest of us have been. Ladies and gentlemen, Christine directors, first of all, thank you for inviting me today. It is said that the world is built in small steps, or maybe even in small jabs, we are here today. Relatively speaking, at least. Because, as a famous person once said, that one small step for man can be a giant leap for mankind. At SDU, we took a small step six years ago then established the first center for advanced studies. It was at that time the first in the Nordic countries. It endured mostly due to the dedication of our two center leaders who kept taking small steps relentlessly and sometimes in the face of opposition. Last year in September we had the official opening of Danish Institute for Advanced Studies or DINES as I like to call it in everyday speech. Another small step, some would say, but in my opinion, it was a leap of faith. Since then, the directors have been taking many more small steps. From one perspective, their feet are moving so fast, one would think they're actually running at this time. And I like that. I like people with fast minds and fast feet. And I love to see the long way years has come since the beginning and the promising road ahead. And I respect it because small steps that leads a university in a new direction takes guts. It takes hard work, it takes a whole lot of dedication. Within the next couple of years, the years will move into the new building. And as you can see from the present day, we truly need a new building, a new venue. This would be a <coughs> building we have designed with only years in mind. And it will mark yet another small step, some would say, but I dare say it is a quantum leap. <coughs> no matter what, let us never forget that one small step for years is always a giant leap for the rest of the university. So to all of you here today, keep thinking, keep moving, never give up, never let down, and best of luck. And now I leave the floor to Dean Martin Sagalidis. Thank you very much. Um, so the reason I'm standing here is that the uh, Henrik director, he asked me to become what we call an executive uh, chair of the, of the governance board for DS. Um, and we are working very hard now to hire the first assistant professors in DS. I think uh, DS is a really unique construction. Um, it it's, hasn't been seen in, in Denmark before, of course, and not in so many countries. Uh, um, and uh, the logistics in making this construction and also hiring these new professors is, 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 is quite uh, immense actually. And, uh, but we hope that uh, we have the deadline now here on the 15th of February. And we hope maybe in half a year or so, uh, maybe a little bit <coughs> that in the autumn sometime, we really can start DIAS because then we have really hired first young people that will start doing some blue sky research. And, and that will also be at the time when hopefully our rector again uh, will open DS for the, I don't know which time, but <laughs> <laughs> second, third time. <laughs> uh, so that will be really the, 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 the breaking point for DS, and then in a couple of years we'll have the new building, uh, and, and that will also be great. So with those words, um, I would like uh, Francesco to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thanks to uh, Eric and Martin, and again, it's good also to sometimes uh, say thank you to the administration that has uh, really uh, invested in blue sky research. Right? We often, as a researcher, we always say that you know we have forgotten, but that's not the case. I would say it's uh, it's a remarkable feast for the university to demonstrate that investing in blue sky research is <coughs> crucial, and for humanity to go forward, and for Denmark to be basically be one of the leading countries. It's no, there is no, it's no secret that without blue sky research, you know, countries don't really leap forward, right? You can see what happened on the world scene, and any step backwards from the uh, from blue sky research is actually a step backwards for humanity. Right? We go back to the Middle Ages. Okay. 
great place to start was sky research again. So I think it's very, very crucial for, 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 for us in general, to mankind in general, but especially for Denmark to start taking peak. And I would say it starts with more steps. And this, uh, it is really from the bottom of our researcher hearts to thank the deans and the and director to actually be able to see that and to help with that. We went to start in 2017 with a great lecture and uh, we were lucky to get Christine to come here. Christine Stabel Ben was an outstanding uh, professor. It would be for rectifying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she actually is a professor at our university uh, at the UNSE. I don't, cannot pronounce what the open stands for, but at the open university of southern Denmark, which is actually a center for that. And she's a colleague also as a central leader of the Danish National Research Foundation for uh, vitamin and vaccines called CVIVA. She has been on an immense number of boards and an immense number of uh, other fundamental uh, science for uh, uh, vitamin and vaccines. She's the head of the Banding Health Project at the Hayton Serum Institute and has had health positions in uh, layers. And as you will hear today, she's also actually a person that is a lot in the field, which is great. It's a fantastic thing. So I would like to welcome Christine. First of all, thank her to uh, accept the invitation to open this evening and to uh, give us a uh, presentation. Thank you. thank you very much, all of you, for inviting me here today to talk about vaccines and to be the first speaker in 2017 in this uh, exciting DS, which I'm really, I really feel invigorated and excited to hear about today and all the progress that you have made and are planning in the future. So I'm really honored to be here and look forward to telling you about my research and hopefully creating some discussion. Usually I do create some discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I can uh, rectify my uh, screen if that's possible. Yeah. <coughs> Francesco alluded to, I have a lot of different hats on. Um, you're going to hear a lot about the research which takes place in one of the places that I'm affiliated with, and that's the Vanden Health Project in Guinea-Bissau in West Africa. I don't know, when I came here, I, I had the expectation that you were all kind of a mixed bag of people with different backgrounds. And uh, how many are from life sciences here? <laughs> Natural sciences? Yeah? Humanities? Okay. <laughs> Anyway, I prepared my talk, so I tried to cover some of the basics uh, of, of vaccinology and uh, also at the same time put emphasis on our research process and where we are up to date uh, to present state. But just to make sure that we are all aligned from the beginning, what do I understand about uh, when I talk about vaccines? Well, I talk about a pathogen uh, which is administered to a human being who subsequently develops memory and resistance towards that pathogen. And we distinguish between two types of vaccines, and I think that's going to be important for my talk today uh, to make that distinguishment right now, and that's uh, that we have the live attenuated vaccines, and these are small pathogens which have been weakened, so they enter the body and they create a mild infection, and in most cases we don't even feel we have that infection, but it gives us memory towards that pathogen, so when we subsequently need it, then we have resistance, then we can combat it without getting ill. These live attenuated vaccines um, usually give full protection after one dose. They are very strong vaccines. They are also a little bit dangerous because there is some worry that they can convert into more pathogenic forms. And we also have the problems with people who are immunocompromised, who don't have a really good immune system, like people with HIV and AIDS, for instance. They can actually develop the disease, uh, a permanent disease, if they get the live vaccine. So the world is moving increasingly towards having more non-live vaccines, 
And these are vaccines which contain the whole pathogen or parts of the pathogens or products of the pathogen, but it's dead. So it can't really create any infection in the human body. That means that the immune system is actually quite inert to this pathogen when it's injected because it's not really dangerous, truly dangerous. So often we have to give these vaccines with adjuvants. And that's something which can tickle the immune system so that it recognizes the foreign body and responds to it, develops memory. And even with an adjuvant, it's often necessary to give several doses of these vaccines to develop full protection. So there are some quite fundamental differences in the uh, specific protection induced between live and non-live vaccines. Almost everybody has been vaccinated many times. Is there anybody here who hasn't been vaccinated? Nobody. Everybody has been vaccinated. All of us, even in the low-income countries, have routine child vaccination programs. And here's uh, an example from Guinea Bissau, where I work, where they give BCG against tuberculosis at birth and oral polio vaccine, followed by three doses of the non-live DTP vaccine, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis vaccine, often in the company with hepatitis B and hemophilus influenza vaccine, and oral polio vaccine at 6, 10, and 14 weeks of age, or sometime during infancy. Um, then comes measles vaccine at nine months of age. In our part of the world, we only give it at 15 months of age because that's a big vaccine you want to give so late that you don't have interference from the maternal antibodies, the maternal protection. But in the low-income countries, it's decided to give it as early as possible because there are circulating measles and, and children could be uh, susceptible. In our part of the world, we also increasingly give vaccines to older age groups, to females in puberty against um, uh, cervical cancer and to elderly and travel vaccines are also part of most people's lives. There are vaccine skeptics out there, and we just talked about it, that in the US, uh, Kennedy has been uh, appointed a, the head of a group which looks sort of into vaccines from a critical perspective. In the US, there is a really huge anti-vaccine group, and I want to say upfront that I'm not, uh, I don't sympathize with them or the way of talking about vaccines, <laughs> and, um, uh, that would be clear, but I mean, you could get the suspicion that I was somehow uh, linked to them during my talk, but I, I definitely don't sympathize. To with be this clear, kind of you do not support ah. Trump. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, let's get it clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Make sure that there's no Trump. <laughs> Go suck a lemon. That's, uh, <laughs> anyway, I, uh, I think most people uh, have an understanding that vaccines are really great, and uh, I would like to give you an example from the Bill and Belinda Gates Foundation, which have been absolutely instrumental in rolling out vaccines in the low-income countries, and they definitely want to convey a very positive message of vaccines in their video. And as we just discovered, there's uh, really no sound here apart from my small computer, but you can maybe just enjoy the pictures here. So it's really better with the music. It's like, wow, oh, go, go on, let's get these vaccines out there. Let's get some more vaccines, etc. Conveying a very, very positive message about vaccines. And uh, as I said, I think that's the dominating perception that here, if we try to outline the current paradigm for vaccines, it is that they create this specific immunity against a target infection, and that's perceived as good, that is good, and therefore vaccines are always good. And I think the video also outlines really what is important now, and that is to do some implementation research on how do we get the vaccines out there to all the children. It's to do some laboratory research to develop the vaccines we don't have. The way 
these vaccines are tested. It's inherent in this paradigm. And that is that you only need to test vaccines for their effect on the target infection. It's assumed that you can just calculate their effect on overall mortality if you know the effect on the target infection. So if you have a measles vaccine and you give it to all the children and it's 90% efficacious and measles causes 10% of all the death, then you assume that you can reduce mortality, overall mortality by 9% by immunizing all children. So I really want to emphasize right from the beginning that most of the vaccines, almost all the vaccines used currently today were implemented based on these assumptions on their effect on overall mortality. They were never tested for their effect on overall mortality. They were tested for their effect on the specific disease, and if that was good, it was assumed that it would always be overall beneficial to give the vaccines. And that's quite fundamental for what I will be talking about today. Because I believe, our group believes, that now it's time for a paradigm shift. We aim to end this current, what we've coined the specific solution paradigm, and we want to uh, instead have a new paradigm, uh, a systemic effect paradigm, where we believe, and we try to document, and I'll try to convince you today, that in addition to their very good specific effects, vaccines also have non-specific effects on the immune system. These non-specific effects may be equally important, or even more important than the specific effects. They may be beneficial, but the very controversial part is that they may also, at times, be harmful. So, according to the current <coughs> paradigm, this little boy here gets the vaccine in his shoulder against measles, and he's being immunized against measles, nothing else. And this little girl is being immunized against diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, and nothing else. What I propose is that the boy is getting immunized against measles, but he is, at the same time, getting an immune system training lesson which will enhance his ability to combat other infections, <coughs> other unrelated infections. The girl is getting immunized against DTP, and she's getting a training lesson which will reduce her ability to combat other infections. So she'll be protected against diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, but she'll be more susceptible to other infections in the future. To try to explain why I propose this new paradigm, I have to take you on a journey and it's a journey to near Bissau in West Africa, and it's also a journey in time because I want to go back to where it all started and tell you about the research process which has been going on for almost 40 years and which leads us to uh, propose this new paradigm today. The Bandit Health Project is situated in Guinea-Bissau. It's a small country in West Africa. Most people haven't heard of it, only 1.6 million inhabitants, the size of Jutland. Um, we have established a health and demographic surveillance system site there. Uh, that's a, a, a system site where we cover 100,000 people in the urban study area in six suburbs in the capital of Bissau. And we cover 100,000 people in 182 village clusters scattered in rural Guinea-Bissau. This creates a platform for testing the real life effect of health interventions. The core in our system is the, the home visits. Uh, so in the urban study area, our assistants will go from house to house. Every month they will go and ask about new pregnancies and deliveries. And every three months they will go and visit all the children in the study area, ask how they are, ask if they've been ill since we were there last time, if they've been vaccinated, if they've been to hospital, if they are still breastfeeding, and uh, of course their vital status if they are still alive. Um, in the rural areas we drive out to the villages, um, and we ask the same questions. Focus is on mothers, pregnant women, their deliveries, and on children up to five years of age. We link with the health centers in the study area and with the hospitals, and that means that we can capture all the health information on the day that it happens actually, when the children are vaccinated, when they go into hospital, and when they die at the hospital. This Random Health Project was established in 1978 by Peter Abbey, who's a Danish anthropologist, and uh, he came there to study malnutrition. At that time, every second child died in Guinea-Bissau before reaching five years of age. And everybody thought that this had to be due to malnutrition, because that was the way that one understood the world at that time. But Peter examined a lot of children, established what ended up becoming the Random Health Project, and quickly discovered that there wasn't that much malnutrition around. But he stumbled over something else, uh, because as a service to the community in December 1979, they gave measles vaccine to all children in the study area. That was all children who were at home at that time. 
And with this health and demographic surveillance, they were able to follow the children and what happens in, happened in terms of mortality, which you have up here on the y-axis. And what became evident was that the vaccinated children had much lower mortality than the unvaccinated children. In fact, in a survival analysis, the vaccinated had 70% lower mortality than the unvaccinated children. There wasn't really any measles circulating at that time, not a lot, so the non-vaccinated children did not only just die from a measles infection, uh, and, and according to the WHO, measles infection overall only accounted for 10 to 15% of all death at that time. So really, this was a signal that something was going on with the measles vaccine. It was protecting against measles, but it apparently also protected against other types of death. So I think this uh, is a hallmark in our research process. It's the starting point for all research. It's really the unexpected uh, observation and the possibility of learning something new. The second hallmark is really, of course, always to ask yourself whether this is just a chance finding or can it be repeated elsewhere. Peter went around at that time and asked people and looked for studies which had uh, data to compare mortality before and after the introduction of measles vaccine. And what I show here is a graph presenting all available community studies in the world where they have compared mortality before and after introduction of measles vaccine. And you'll see that uniformly across these studies, mortality decreases by at least 50% after the introduction of measles vaccine. So it's much more than can be ascribed to the specific protection against measles. Measles vaccine was recommended at nine months of age at that time. It still is, by the way. Uh, but in 1989, WHO introduced a new high tide on measles vaccine. And the special thing about that was that it could be given early in the presence of maternal antibodies and it could still create protection. So everybody thought this was a good idea and WHO uh, simply introduced the vaccine from the thought that, you know, this would be good to be able to immunize earlier. And, uh, and Peter also thought that would be really good because he was uh, speculating that if measles vaccine had this effect on overall mortality, then it would be really even better to give it earlier and it would provide an opportunity to test that in a randomized trial comparing the new vaccine given at four and five months of age with the old standard vaccine which was given at nine months of age. So he did a randomized controlled trial and he compared mortality for children who got either uh, the control group here, measles vaccine, normal measles vaccine at nine months of age, or the ESET, the high tidal measles vaccine at four and a half uh, months of age. And what you'll see here where we have the survival probability here on the y-axis is that there is a one group which is quite peculiar, and that's the group of girls in red here who got the high tidal measles vaccine. They have much higher mortality uh, than both boys, who got, for boys it really didn't make a difference, but they also have much higher mortality than the girls who got the control vaccine. This was really curious because the high tidal measles vaccine was a very protective uh, vaccine, so this has nothing to do with measles. It was a protective vaccine which introduced uh, increased mortality. And again, it was important to look for repeatability, so this was checked with colleagues in Senegal and Sudan. They had actually found exactly the same. And later on, researchers, uh, US researchers in Haiti also tested this hypothesis that the high tidal measles vaccine was associated with increased female mortality and found exactly the same. So WHO withdrew the high tidal measles vaccine in 1992 because of excess female mortality, but actually no effort was done to understand what had really been going on. They were just withdrawing it, but no, no research process was initiated. It was speculated vaguely that maybe the vaccine had been too strong for the females, not really scientific explanations. Um, but uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, by that time, we were sitting down, this is by the way 92, when I joined the project, sitting down to try to make sense of the totality of the data, and, and that's the next step in our research process always, to try to make sense and to generate new questions which can then be tested. We had, just to recapitalize, uh, the unexpected observation of measles vaccine, the repeatability that seemed to be beneficial. When we tested the logical deduction that high tidal measles vaccine would be good, we found the opposite. We found twofold higher mortality and among females, so our first conclusion was that something is going on here. Uh, measles vaccine may have non-specific effects, as we coined them, and, uh, and they may be beneficial, but also harmful and sex differential. So the natural next question was, would this apply to other vaccines as well? Nobody had tested them, so this was just you know, really uh, fertile, uh, naive ground to walk out to and, and try to see what actually uh, was the overall mortality effect of other vaccines. 
This is a key publication from our group. It was published in BMJ in 2000, and it created a lot of fuss, and actually several people called the editor at BMJ and tried to make him not uh, publish it because it was so controversial. But this is data from rural Guinea-Bissau, where we went out every six months, checked the vaccination status of children, and followed them until the next uh, home visit in terms of mortality. In this study, we confirmed, this was actually a study done to confirm also the benefits of measles vaccine. We found a very beneficial effect of measles vaccine. But in this sub-study, we focused on the children who were zero to six months of age at the first visit, too young to get measles vaccine. But some of them had received BCG vaccine, some had received BCG and BCP vaccine, and some hadn't been vaccinated yet at the time of our visit. And what you will see here is that between the two visits, Mortality was highest in the children who hadn't been vaccinated at all, and it was much lower in the children who had received BCG vaccine. So BCG was associated with a 45% reduction in all-cause mortality. This cannot be explained by protection of the target disease, because that's tuberculosis, and it takes years to develop, so it's not really a relevant uh, cause of death in these young children. So it could hint to the fact that BCG, like measles vaccine, could have beneficial non-specific effects. But it could also be speculated, of course, that the children who went and got BCG vaccinated, they were somehow stronger up front and they had better survival uh, abilities. It could be confounding, it could be what we call a healthy vaccine effect. So therefore, it was really surprising that when we looked at the group that received both BCG and DCP and presumably were even more healthy, their mother had brought them two times to vaccination, and they had done both types of vaccines, then they had almost the same mortality as the group that hadn't been vaccinated. And in our survival analysis, this yielded an 84% significant increase in mortality, and that was strongest for the females. So, can I ask you? Yeah, question? sure. I mean, there seems to be a correlation with the time, right? I mean, so, so you actually checked for six months at an, inter at an interval of, of what? Every 15 days? Every no, this is uh, information which is captured at the next visit. So this will be on recall, on the mother's recall of the time and, of the day. And what happened, I mean, I'm sure it's, what happened if you go beyond the six months horizon? I mean, because it could be that, you know, the BC, BGC plus DP gets better if you wait longer. So yeah, it right. doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. Okay. It, it only, it only starts changing when they get measles vaccine. Nice. So it's, it's a point that I'll come back okay. to. It's the most recent vaccine which seems to, so you can aggregate this with measles vaccine, but not before. At least we believe that the negative effects of DCP are seen for at least six months. Um, um, yeah, good question. Anyway, with regard to, to BCG, we had some good opportunities for doing proper randomized studies uh, to get rid of the potential healthy vaccine effect. Because we had a policy in Guinea-Bissau and many other low-income countries that children with a low birth weight below 2.5 kilos they don't get BCG at birth, they only get it around six weeks of age together with the first uh, pentavalent vaccines. So that gave us an ethical possibility um, to, to do randomized studies where we randomize children to BCG or to be in the control group and just follow the normal policy or to get BCG when they're discharged from the maternity ward. So in that way we could compare from zero to six weeks of age in a relatively unbiased fashion, BCG recipients and non-BCG recipients. And we've done a total of uh, three trials, uh, consecutive trials in Guinea-Bissau. They have slightly different um, study populations uh, and slightly different primary outcomes, but the results were actually quite uniform. If we look at the period up to 28 days after birth, the neonatal period, then we see in all three trials that the group that received BCG early had much lower mortality than the group that received BCG later. The three trials consecutively done had lower and lower mortality, um, and the relative effect of BCG became lower and lower, which is not actually surprising because there is a part of the death which we probably can't reach with BCG vaccination related to uh, delivery accidents, asphyxia, uh, malformations, etc. cetera. Uh, when we do a, a combined analysis in the neonatal period, the study together yield a very significant 38% reduction in all-cause mortality up to 28 days after birth if you receive BCG early on. The effect was apparent already after three days and it also was sustained up to one year of age, about a little bit lower at that time. 
The two first studies here have been published. The third one with the meta-analysis is, is on its way. We believe that this is very strong evidence that the policy of not giving BCG to low birth weight children at birth should be abandoned, and it should really be a policy to get BCG out to the children in Africa as quickly as possible. With regard to DCP, we are a little bit more in trouble because it's recommended at 6, 10, and 14 weeks of age, and it's not considered, we cannot give it earlier, and it's considered ethically problematic to postpone vaccination in some children. So we haven't been able to do proper randomized trial with early versus delayed DTP to actually investigate its effect on mortality. So there we rely on observational study designs, but there are actually quite good observational study designs around. Um, and one here is a kind of natural experiment. It's from the introduction of DTP, which our teams did in the rural areas of Guinea-Bissau in 84 to 87. At that time, we gave it as a service to the community, so there was no effort done to evaluate, evaluate the effect on mortality because all that came in later on. So it was only in the beginning of the 2000s that we digged out the data and said to ourselves what actually happened when we had introduced DTP in the belief that we were doing something good. And what turned out to be the case was that the group that had received DTP by our teams had almost twofold higher mortality than the group that hadn't received DTP by our teams. If anything, the bias would favor uh, the vaccinated because the unvaccinated children were those who were traveling or sick, and then there were days without vaccines. So just really, it was a matter of randomness whether you were vaccinated or not. Please note that this is the only study available in the global literature on what happened when DCP was introduced in those countries. <coughs> so it's actually possible. There's no data to suggest that this is not what's the actual outcome. This is the only piece of evidence we have of the effect on overall mortality of introducing this vaccine. So, so can I ask, yeah. as, a, as, a, as a potential patient, <laughs> but when people introduce these things, DDP, I mean, what kind of studies they have done before they do it? They just looked at the antibody uh, response uh, and saw that you could create in the human in body. Uh, yeah, no, well, also, also in vivo, you can uh, take out blood and okay. you can measure that you have resistance in the blood That's against uh, the diseases. And you definitely also see a drop in the sure. disease rate. So the children who get three doses of tetanus, they don't get tetanus. Uh, so, 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 so. But it's not study kind of on the demographic of it. No, no. And if you look at the demographics, you will, for instance, see. Well, I'll come back to yep. that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, here are all the studies that we have been able to do and find anywhere in the global literature and which were done ourselves and the effect of DTP versus no DTP on mortality. And I'll just explain these plots because there's going to be a few of them. Here we have one, and it's comparing DTP vaccinated versus no DTP vaccinated. So if the ratio is one, that means mortality is equal in the two groups. If it's less than one, it favors DTP. If it's above one, it favors no DTP. And you'll see that all eight studies here are on the right-hand side of one. They all indicate that there's higher mortality in the DTP vaccinated than the non-DTP vaccinated. Here you have the study I showed before, the introduction of, of DTP in the rural areas of Guinea-Bissau, but all the studies yield similar uh, conclusions. And in a meta-analysis of all the eight studies, a very significant twofold higher mortality in, um, in the risk of dying, uh, twofold higher mortality in the children who received DTP versus those who did not receive DTP. And as I hinted, this is strongest in females. So here are the same eight studies, but just for females, 2.56 times higher mortality, highly, highly significant. If girls have higher mortality when they receive DTP, then one would expect that the female male mortality would be higher when DTP was the most recently, vaccine, recently received vaccine. And that is what we show here. Here we have all studies, there are many more of them, because here we don't need a control group, we just have the children who are DTP vaccinated, and we look at boys and girls, and whether they have the same mortality. One indicates that boys and girls have the same mortality. Above one, that females have higher mortality than boys, and you'll see that almost consistently, girls have higher mortality than boys in the DTP window. And now I thought a lot of you would think, oh, but that's because they treat girls worse than boys mm -hmm. in Africa. But they actually don't. And in the pre-vaccination era, there was no difference in mortality between boys and girls. They breastfeed them equally. They go to schools at the same level. It, 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 this is a South Asian problem. It's not an African problem. Uh, but anyhow, I thought just to convince you that this is not the case, I would bring here the similar plot when measles vaccine is the most recent vaccine. And here you will see consistently 
that girls had lower mortality than males. Unless you believe there's some kind of strange uh, age sex differential treatment, this cannot be explained from a social perspective. This seems to be a very strong argument that this has to do with some biology uh, in the vaccines. Sorry, is it in the vaccine? I was saying the immunosystem of, of Yeah, of that's a good question. We'll take that into the discussion because, yeah, but it's, uh, yeah, let's come back to that. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for, for mentioning that. I'll come back to that a little bit later, but I'll just say briefly here that these are the 95% confidence intervals. Um, but, but I'll address but exactly statistical that. errors coming from the number of cases that are. Yeah, so it, it basically says that if you have um, <coughs> an estimate like this, and you can also see it from the, from the actual numbers here. The 95% confidence interval does not cross one, so it basically says that your study is not compatible with the idea that there's no difference in mortality. Whereas a study like this one absolutely includes the possibility that there is the same mortality in the two groups. So this is a three sigma. Huh? Those are up to three sigma. Oh, okay. Three sigma I mean 95%. I mean, it's not. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, yeah, three sigma. Yeah, I'll come back to exactly that. But as in energy physics, <laughs> when we make a discovery, it must be at five sigma, which is 99.9999. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll come back to, uh, to exactly the point about uh, statistical significant findings. Uh, I, I just promise you five minutes we are there. Uh, but for now, I'll just say that, I, I, uh, just to recapitalize again, we are, we are on a journey in time here, and now we've reached 2003. And uh, done a lot of studies now, not only on measles vaccine, but also on BCG and DCP vaccine. And the status uh, by that time was that we had found these live attenuated vaccines, measles vaccine and BCG, uh, were associated with reductions in mortality. But, uh, but the live high tidal measles vaccine seemed to have some problems, and also the non-live DCP vaccine. Both of these vaccines had been associated with increased female mortality. So the question which popped up was, could it be that because the high tidal measles vaccine was given early and children generally are delayed in their vaccination program, some children had gotten DTP after the high tidal measles vaccine. And that was the real culprit. That was the real cause of the increased female mortality. Having the measles vaccine that early meant that many more children would end up having DTP as the most recent vaccine. So with that a priori hypothesis, we went back to the old high tidal measles vaccine data, every one of them we could get hold on and we confirmed exactly that. If we look at the studies where there was no DTP given after high tidal measles vaccine, mortality was similar in boys and girls in all the studies. All the excess female mortality came from the studies where children had received DTP after high tidal measles vaccine. So the conclusion for this study is really that high tidal measles vaccine might have been the cause for the wrong reasons. It could have been that it was actually the real problem was that the high tidal measles vaccine altered the sequence of vaccinations. So, in the mid-2000s, uh, we were where we thought things started to make a lot of sense. We had the measles vaccine and PCG, and potentially both the measles and the high tidal measles vaccine had beneficial effects. At least we didn't have to, to combat this problem anymore with the high tidal measles vaccine, which was live and still associated with increased female mortality, because that seemed to be limited to the non-live vaccines. We had also come to emphasize much more that um, the effects are seen as one of the vaccines, the most recent vaccine, so DTP after measles vaccine, as I explained, is harmful for females, and we have actually also shown the opposite, measles vaccine after DTP would abrogate the negative effects of DTP. And uh, now, a decade later, we're actually much further, and that was what I also just talked about it before my, my talk started here, that we have also shown now for smallpox vaccine, um, and for all polio vaccine, both these live attenuated vaccines are associated with similar beneficial non-specific effects as measles vaccine and PCG vaccine. And we have definitely also expanded on the non-live vaccine <coughs> and added pentavalent vaccine, hepatitis B vaccine, inactivated polio and uh, H1N1 influenza vaccine to vaccines where we have uniformly and consistently seen excess female mortality compared with male mortality. Maybe this is out of context, but still, what about the background uh, fact of the population? Suppose you have a cohort, a population that has been received this vaccine, uh, and then you have new, rather than uh, where you start, so to say, uh, on a population where a lot of the population have not received the, the, the vaccine. So is there 
some kind of endogenous effect that I think you swear suppose to all the grown-ups have received their vaccine versus yeah. a population where none have received it. I don't think there's any population where you can make that complete... Uh, or fewer. I imagine fewer have in uh, Guinea uh, Bissau. <coughs> yeah, I mean, in, in sort of on an ecological level, compare populations. Correct, correct. Yeah, I mean, they yield the same uh, results. I, I, I wish I'd taken them today, but we have some very nice mortality curves from uh, Guinea Bissau, from Gambia, from Sudan, from Zaire. I think we've been able to show for all these places, it's published, and I can find it to you, that you have some quite strange mortality curves for children. So if you look from um, from zero months up to three months of age, girls have lower mortality than boys. But then it crosses over, and girls have higher mortality than boys in the DCP window. Once they start receiving measles vaccine, the curves cross again. So you can show on an ecological level that this impacts, and, and uh, these effects are so dramatic, so they actually impact the overall uh, mortality yeah, in the population. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's in the panel of uh, background. Yes, it's, 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 it's all cause mortality. It's, it's uh, just, uh, yeah, in the context. Yeah. This excess, this excess mortality, is that all they've served in the African countries or is it in Europe as well? Do you know anything? <laughs> we have looked at it for uh, measles vaccine and for pentavalent vaccine in Denmark, um, not in terms of mortality, because fortunately we don't die from uh, so much in infancy. Not maybe more hepatitis. <laughs> huh? Or maybe considering more the hepatitis. Yeah, um, no, um, it hasn't been done. Uh, and, and, and I think it's difficult, it's studies which are difficult to do in our setting because we have so low mortality. But what we have tried to do is to look for hospitalization for infectious diseases. And there we have found that having measles vaccine is associated, we published that two years ago, is associated with a reduced risk of hospitalizations for any cause. If you receive pentavalent vaccine after measles vaccine, uh, or MMR as it's called in Denmark, then your risk of hospitalizations increases. So we published two years ago that you actually seem to have the same pattern for measles vaccine and pentavalent vaccine in our part of the world with regard to infectious diseases as we see for mortality in, in low income countries. So I, we are still, it's something we look very much into and try to, to see if we can study uh, more because uh, of course it would be extremely interesting if these are general effects on the immune <coughs> system, if we can also see them in our context in, in an increased susceptibility to infection. How long are you studying the period of time? Is it until one year of age or five years of age? It depends, and it's all—it's a very good question because it all depends on what you're interested in studying. But what, what we really emphasize is to study a vaccine as long as it's the most recent vaccine. So these things interact with each other, these vaccines interact with each other. So to get at the clearest comparison, we try to emphasize the time window until a new vaccine is given, which makes it difficult sometimes to get to the power <coughs> because the vaccines are given ever so frequently. But I have to say, for BCG and smallpox vaccine, the two old vaccines which were given intradermally, some of you will have received them, some of you are too young to have received them, but, but they seem to have some really long-term imprinting effects which overrule whichever vaccines come after. So we just published this year, of 2016, a paper where we compared adults in Denmark who were born between 65 and 76, uh, and they experienced the phase out of BCG and smallpox vaccine, and there we could uh, say it was quite random whether you were born just before or after the uh, phase out. So we compared them and also controlled for all kinds of background factors. And the adults who had received smallpox vaccine and or BCG vaccine had 46% lower mortality up to the age of 46 than those who hadn't received the vaccines. Mm -hmm. So this really seemed to be, if true, some very long-term imprinting effect of getting a vaccine early in childhood on your subsequent risk of dying. And this was from natural causes. So if you look at suicides and murders and uh, traffic accidents, there was no effect, uh, so that was quite reassuring. <laughs> yes? Which uh, infectious diseases do you see that I, cause I, increased in? Yeah, uh, I, I, uh, in, in the Danish setting? No, no, in the uh, That's a question I get asked a lot of times, and the problem is we, we rely on verbal autopsies. If we go in with Danish stand-up care and so on, we would we would ruin the reality we are studying, so we don't, we rely on observing what happens in the Guinean context, and that means we are left not with advanced diagnostics and blood measurements and... and so you uh, don't even know if it's an infectious disease? That we, is we know most of it is, as we can discriminate between, if we do a verbal autopsy, we ask the mother, we can rule out the, uh, and we always do that, the uh, accidents, burns, uh, traffic accidents and so on, and, and presumably most of it is uh, infectious diseases. 
but we have it in very broad categories, presumed malaria, fever, diarrhea, uh, coughing. For the small children, this can be virtually anything. All diseases can manifest with these symptoms. So in terms of nailing the specific pathogens, we still have uh, quite far to go. It sounds like you're making a case for continuing smallpox vaccination. Yes, yes. <laughs> Even though there's no smallpox to vaccinate yes, again. Yes, yes. It's a very relevant question because I, I think it'll be difficult to get the smallpox vaccine out of the freezer because it's actually, uh, there was some side effects to the smallpox vaccine, but I would, I mean, given the chance, I would take it any day because I, I, I think the data is quite convincing. But it's extremely relevant in terms of polio and measles because the world is about to eradicate these two diseases mm. and with that, the two live vaccines against them. So I think this can be potentially extremely important in the future. In 2020, the world will stop all the polio vaccine and, and uh, because of the eradication of polio. And, and my prediction is that mortality will start increasing again. Um, because as a, as a population, we've evolved with these diseases. Yes, yes. So that yeah. it, it might make sense yes. that we should continue to yes. need to benefit from being exposed yeah. to them. Yes, you say it better than I said. Exactly. I think you needed to answer the question about meningitis. With? You need it because cases of meningitis is such With meningitis? Yeah. yeah. Is that are growing in Italy and they're actually now producing extra vaccine for that. Yeah. Yeah, it was came out for the news a couple of days ago. Anyway, I will uh, just uh, jump to my next slide, <laughs> which is uh, about uh, the controversy regarding our findings. Because, of course, I guess you can see already now that proposing that a vaccine can have negative effects can be considered extremely controversial. And actually, we, we pitched the idea with Cecilia Gassang uh, that she could write her scientific crime novel after the feather of the dinosaur based on our research. <laughs> and, and she did exactly that. I don't know if any of you have read the book, but, uh, but she uh, describes our research setting quite nicely. Uh, here she is. Uh, she visited Gassang and researched for the book, and, and she looked very much into our literature, etc. And, and she, with some uh, limitations, of course, her editor complained when the book was more than 1,000 pages long and full of research. <laughs> she managed to give a good picture of our research and, and also create a very interesting, I think, of course, crime novel which happens about this uh, or relates to this murder, potential murder of a professor who proposed that vaccines have negative effects. <laughs> um, <laughs> I will shift gears with that and talk a bit about our research process because it's becoming increasingly uh, uh, clear to me that this is something we need to address in our group because we get a lot of critique for that and it's also quite different from what other people do. We have done that along the road, I think inspired by Peter's background in anthropology and uh, inspiration by Kuhn, but it's getting more and more clear to me and also in the medical world, which is getting more and more rigorous, that we get into clashes all the time in terms of research uh, methodology and research processes. So I've tried to emphasize in my talk the different hallmarks of our research, and I've, I've summarized them here, starting with the unexpected observations, the need to really test all the time that the observations are repeatable, to make deductions and confirm such deductions, um, and continuously aim to account for the totality of data. <coughs> I've tried to make a model for it here, quite uh, simple, but, but you will see that I've emphasized consistency a lot of time. And I think the most important point for me really is to, to make deductions and test these deductions, and in the case we're able to confirm them, for me that's an extremely important thing. So like we did for the high tidal measles vaccine, that we actually saw the increased mortality after high tidal measles vaccine, we saw it after DTP vaccine, and we put together the two facts, made the deduction that the high tidal incident was due to DTP and were able to confirm it. This is the part of the circle here which I find most convincing and most uh, inspiring to, to go on. At this stage, I think we are quite far in terms of contradicting the old specific solution paradigm. We simply have more than hundreds of studies which contradict that vaccines only have specific effects. But I also have to admit that we're still crawling in this space here. We are making all these circles, and a lot of times we don't confirm ourselves. We see new things, and we need to, to find out whether that's a part which is compatible with our paradigm, or whether we, in fact, sometimes should consider again to go back to the old paradigm or to make new reformulations of our deductions and test those. I, um, I was really relieved quite recently when I came across you know, Lagatos. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess he's much bigger in natural sciences, but he never really reached the medical social world. Social science. Social science. Social science. Social science. Yeah. Yeah. 
In medicine, we talk about copper and we talk about coon, but like I said, I've never heard about uh, previously. <laughs> uh, we talk a lot about copper. Anyway, but, but, but I think it, his model for research actually makes a lot of sense uh, for the type of research we do in this paradigm shifting phase of our research, where we have some sacred things, some hardcore hypotheses that we don't go out and falsify and, and, and reject every time we falsify them. In, instead, we have developed a protective belt of health hypothesis or auxiliary hypothesis, which may be changed <coughs> during this course within this circle uh, of, of making deductions, testing them, and reformulating deductions. And, and I really agree with Lagutas that the progress in science is made, as I said, when theories are making surprising deductions that can be confirmed, and the content of the theory is increased. And that is in sharp contrast to the medical world, world and how we are working right now. And I think for good reason to try to, to, to prevent the medical industry from running away with new results and findings, we have, we have put down this narrow, narrow way of doing research over our heads, which is also spilling over to basic research. And that's really a pity from my perspective, because everything now in the medical world is about comparing A versus B and a P above or below 0 0.05 uh, as like the only criterion for whether something is valid or not. So I showed you before this pattern here, this, uh, this plot of the impact of the TP vaccine on mortality and all these eight studies, which to me uh, was convincing uh, and, and looked consistent. I also, uh, yeah, anyway, you asked, and, and here's the time to address this question. The critique I get when I show this plot to people is, why do you keep on studying the same thing? You know, why, why make eight small studies? And, and you know, some of them are really small, and the confidence interval includes one. So this is really, I mean, you just throw these away, please. They are, they show no difference between vaccinated and non-vaccinated. So, so why at all bother with them? And I think it's really an unfair and sad critique because I think what is important to me here is the pattern. It's the consistency of the observations. I'm actually shooting myself in the foot when I try to look into the Indian paper to tailor out or tease out the numbers on mortality in the different vaccine groups because all my all the people who, who, who distrust us, they will say, why, what is this rubbish research? For me, it's important to do nonetheless because it's yet another piece in the puzzle. It's a small piece in the puzzle, but it all needs to make sense. It all needs to add up and you know, we need to look at the totality of data. Um, so, so I think this is uh, a, a point that I'm trying to emphasize more and more. Yeah. I mean, but so if I, if I would like to, for example, reduce the error of bias, right? Would that be a sample of people that should be increased? I and mean, what would make basically increase yeah. the significance? It, 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 it's a very good question, and that's why P0 point, and there's actually some of the world's greatest biased statisticians just wrote a paper about that and said we can't use just pure zero, P0.05 zero zero because this is a, a mixture of effect size, of population size, uh, random variation in the background. It, I mean, it's, 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 it doesn't really capture a lot. Uh, um, so, so again, it just emphasizes for me that p-values and even con uh, confidence intervals, which sort of are the same, that, that should, to some extent, be, there should be much less emphasis on that and much more emphasis on pattern uh, recognition. Yeah. And they say that, yeah. and just in a if I take something in, in a clinic or in another place, mm. and then I do the statistics, when I reduce the errors on, by making on two independent, uh, if I do, I mean, right now you're not combining these, you just, I am actually combining them here in the analysis. Case, uh, okay. analysis. Yeah. But, but I think your point is really something that I would love to work further on, and that is how, for, for me, and uh, I think methods are also now starting to come up in epidemiology, which is really my field, about doing triangulation and, and discussing what is really, how can you do causal inference when you have these types of studies. And, and to me, it's really a very strong piece of evidence if you can do the study in two different settings where there are two different biases and, and confounding structures, and you can find the same result. Uh, but of course, you can also in that road be contradicted. But what, in my, where we are right now, we don't reject our hypothesis, but we ask ourselves, what are the differences between the two settings, and how can we reconcile the differences with a meaningful auxiliary hypothesis that we then move on to test? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering about, I mean, on patterns also regarding, uh, you have a sequence effect or ordering effect. Uh, could imagine you would also have um, interaction uh, among these vaccines mapped onto the non-specific effects. Mm. Yeah. 
and uh, that seems to be quite complicated. It is very complicated. And do you have anything on that? On that? Here you have isolated two vaccines, yeah. and you can trace it up. Mm. Suppose you had the whole uh, envelope yeah. of vaccines yeah. and the ordering of those. Yes. So have you begun to look into that? Or? We look very much at interactions is really the key word for us right yeah. now. It's, it's, uh, because it's clear when you start thinking about the immune system, not only as a copy machine, you bring in a pathogen and the body starts making copies of that to prevent itself the next time. If you start thinking of the immune system more like a brain, the way that you've done something and you transfer it to other unrelated situations, then the system, of course, is influenced by what's going on at the time when you receive uh, the vaccine in terms of other infections and in terms of other vaccines. And, and it's influenced by the subsequent vaccine. So we look so much into it. So it's also going to be a feature here, a combination and sequence of vaccine. Uh, it's difficult to study. It's all age dependent. And we have these factors about not being able to do randomized trials of everything. Uh, but but it's uh, definitely something I think is a fruitful, very fruitful area. I have several questions. <laughs> yeah. so, so just one comment on the p-values. Like if you go into information <laughs> theories, you might get around part of these issues. And uh, but that is like yeah. the, the, the other sort of newer statistics that uh, might help you in your arguments. Yeah. Um, I have a, a few questions related to understanding more the mechanisms behind it, or if you have started to think I'll, about I'll, that. I'll come back to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I also suggest we also be interrupting a lot. <laughs> 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 I enjoy it, but I know time is running. No, 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 yeah, okay. some of the questions I might address during my... And then we'll come uh, back to all the questions yeah. back afterwards. So I'm the contributor. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to discuss for the rest of the night, really. So, so just uh, we'll take the questions afterwards if there are any left. Uh, I'll go back a little bit to our research process and to more uh, recent results. Uh, because there, there really seemed to be a reason to reinvent this idea about giving early measles vaccine after we found out that the problem was uh, DTP after measles vaccine. Uh, so we designed a randomized trial where we preconditioned that all children should have received all the DTP vaccines before they entered the trial. And then we randomized them to measles vaccine or no measles vaccine at four months of age. Uh, and we gave them all the uh, recommended measles vaccine at nine months of age. And here we were able to confirm that the early measles vaccine was associated with <coughs> reduced mortality. So comparing mortality up to three years of age, uh, there was 30% lower mortality in the early measles vaccine group, which received two doses of measles vaccine, versus the group that received just one measles vaccine. One thing which came out of that study was another unexpected observation. Uh, as I told you, measles vaccine is normally given uh, later to avoid interference with maternal antibodies, which are seen as something bad. It can reduce the response to measles vaccine. But actually, when we looked at mortality among the children who had maternal measles antibodies or no maternal measles antibodies when they got their measles vaccine. We saw, it's a small study, but still statistically significant if you are interested in that kind of things, <laughs> that vaccination in the presence of maternal antibodies was associated with 71% lower mortality than vaccination in the presence of no maternal antibodies. So completely contradicting the idea that you should wait and give your vaccine when you're rid of your maternal antibodies, it seemed to suggest that it was good to be vaccinated when you had some priming from your mother. Please remember that because that's going to come back to us in a little while because, um, as I said, we have been really interested in taking the findings back to Denmark and we did that in 2012 to 13 <coughs> when we conducted the CalMed study. Those of you who are Danish will know that the BCG vaccine was known as the CalMed vaccine in Denmark. So we thought most people would relate to that name rather than the BCG study. So we called it the CalMed study. And indeed, many of the mothers remembered the Calmet uh, vaccine, either because they had received them themselves or their siblings had received them and so on. So that was a good name for a, a good study. A very lot of hard work from a lot of people conducted in two hospitals in Copenhagen and one in Kolding. Um, as I mentioned earlier, BCG at school age was based out in Denmark in the early 1980s. So that meant the cohorts that were born between 65 and 76 really experienced the phase out. Um, so uh, we have no children, no BCG in, in Denmark uh, at this time. So we could randomize children to receive BCG at birth or no BCG at birth. And we had the preliminary hypothesis, uh, the priori hypothesis, sorry, that uh, BCG would be associated with a 20% reduction in hospitalizations and a 40% reduction in the risk of eczema. 
as I mentioned, uh, some of the mothers had themselves received BCG vaccine. That was the group of the older mothers who had received it at school age, um, and they were equally distributed in the BCG group and the control group. It was around 17% of the mothers. So that provided an opportunity for us to test whether maternal priving mattered for the effect of BCG. First, overall, no effect of BCG. So really disappointing. We had a 20% reduction in the effect of hospitalization, and we saw nothing. Um, even, even we looked at all cause hospitalization, we looked at infectious disease hospitalization, no signal whatsoever of any effect of BCG vaccination. However, when we stratified our maternal BCG vaccination status, we saw that there were significant differences in the response to BCG depending on whether you had a mother who had received BCG or your mother had not received BCG. So among the children whose mothers had received BCG, we actually saw a protective effect of BCG, particularly or only among infectious disease hospitalization. So with regard to BCG, I think in Guinea-Bissau, we have shown, as I also showed you previously, uh, in three trials, a reduction in neonatal mortality in a context where most mothers have been BCG vaccinated themselves. In Denmark, we found no oral effect, but we found a, an effect in children of mothers who were BCG vaccination, vaccinated. So I think this is a, a way to illustrate our way of working. Some people would say, okay, you, you failed, you uh, falsified your hypothesis, let's leave that BCG business alone. For us, this Lagatos uh, point of view actually or method actually makes a lot of sense here. We maintain our hard core. We still believe, also based on all the other studies, that BCG has beneficial non-specific effects. But we help this hypothesis with the auxiliary hypothesis of maternal priming is important for this. So the really important question here is that could we then confirm this? Is this just a hypothesis we invent to save our hypothesis and, and uh, to combat uh, critique? And uh, actually, yes, it seems to be the case. As I mentioned, it is in alignment with our findings from measles vaccine, which inspired this analysis. But we have also just very, very preliminary results repeated the finding in the study from Guinea Bissau, where we looked at mothers who had BCG scar or no BCG scar, and the benefit of BCG in their children, and confirmed that the children who benefit from the BCG the most are those whose mothers have a BCG scar. So yet another example on this research process of continuously trying to make sense of the totality of data and of continuously making <coughs> health hypotheses, but also challenging these hypotheses to increase our explanatory power. I'll talk briefly about politics, also because time is running. Uh, politics is extremely important because unlike other research fields, <coughs> vaccinology is not really a research field. It's also a very political field. So I, th I think in physics, you are allowed to say a thing like, I challenge the second law of thermodynamic without being killed, but, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> that's actually, if you have some data to support it, you will say, that's a brilliant, then tell me more about that. But in vaccinology, if you challenge the current paradigm, you get into the problem that the system wants to protect the reputation of vaccines so much because we all depend on having high vaccination coverage and herd immunity and so on. So any kind of critique of vaccines are met with great resistance, and particularly, as I also hinted to earlier, our findings in relation to DTP. So we've tried to get through to WHO, the World Health Organization, with our findings uh, with uh, various luck, but in 2014, they finally decided to conduct an independent review uh, of all the epidemiological evidence for non-specific effects of BCG uh, and measles vaccine and deteriorated sexual pertussis vaccine. And for BCG and measles vaccine, the conclusion was a beneficial effect of measles vaccine and BCG on overall mortality in the estimated uh, region of a halving of mortality. So they actually supported our overall conclusions. With regard to DTP vaccine, they were somewhat more reluctant. I was in the working group here, so I know how many, extremely many discussions took place before these words were, became exactly these words here. <laughs> but they said that the results are consistent with the idea that DTP may have detrimental effects, but they also noted as a big caveat that these studies come from a group in Guinea Bissau who have often written in defense of such hypotheses. <laughs> 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 anyway, when published in, in just a few months ago in BMJ, uh, I think they had strengthened the conclusions a little bit, uh, and, and they actually said here that, that receipt of DTP may be associated with higher all-cause mortality, and they also emphasized that there is a need for randomized trials to examine the position of DTP in the vaccination chain. So I think we have some uh, 
some support now, some acknowledgement about our findings, there's still a long way to go. And I think one point which I was sorry that the review didn't emphasize more was that the effect of the vaccines in the review, so this is just based on the WHO review, taking the meta estimates of the different vaccines from the review. The, the point they, they didn't mention sufficiently, I think, is that the effects are highly homogeneous. These three vaccines do not have similar effect on mortality. And to my knowledge, there's no bias which can explain why three vaccines should have such different vaccine, uh, effect on mortality, if not due to some kind of biology. So, as of today, here are our main principles of our new systemic effect paradigm. I've talked about those in yellow here, that the live vaccines have beneficial non-specific effects, the non-live have harmful non-specific effects, they are sex differential, so girls are most affected by the harmful non-specific effects. They are strongest, and here we are back to the interaction, uh, they are strongest for the most recent vaccine. So vaccines interact with other vaccines and also with vitamins, that's actually another whole another research field. So the sequence and combination of vaccines is extremely important for their effect on all cause mortality. And then I've talked about how we believe now it's an emerging principle that maternal immunity enhances the beneficial non-specific effects of live vaccines. And we have many more observations on the road. Um, I put them in here next to the answer to the same questions from the current specific solution paradigm perspective. And I, I don't think you should read it all, but I just want to emphasize that for all these different points, the two paradigms are absolutely incompatible. So there's no both one and the other. There's no way of integrating these two paradigms. It's either or. Um, yeah, so a little bit about the immunological mechanism. One part where the two paradigms also differ is that the effects of vaccines are thought, in the, according to the specific paradigm point of view, to be mediated through development of specific memory B and T cells. But we've actually proposed something differently, and that is due to our really great uh, collaborator, Mihai Nitea from Nairobi University, who was just awarded the Spinoza Prize last year for his work on trained innate immunity, and, and that is the work on BCG vaccination that he has done, uh, most of it in collaboration with our research center. Uh, Mihai Nitea is attacking the idea, the dogma, that there are two types of immune systems, the adaptive and the innate, and it's only the adaptive immune system which builds immunological memory. So currently the belief is, the general belief is that the innate immune system lacks immunological memory. Um, but actually that doesn't seem like a very plausible um, uh, paradigm or dogma because it's only 5% of all living species which have an adaptive immune system. Actually 95% of all living species, plants and insects and so on, they do very well with an innate immune system. And actually that system can learn, they know that with plant people and insect people, but it has never really been transferred into the human world before Mihai Nitea started looking at that and showed in some really uh, groundbreaking uh, pieces of work that if you have a primary infection, you get an innate immune response, we know that, but it also leaves a priming on the immune system, on the innate immune system. So in some situations, you have a more alert innate immune system after the first response, and when you get a secondary infection, you'll get a much higher response and a quicker clearance of your infection. But in other situations, you will get a depression of the activity in your innate immune system, and you will develop a kind of tolerance, which means that when you have your secondary infection, you won't even make this little blood you would actually not respond at all. So they have shown that the innate immune system has a memory, it can be trained and it can be beneficial, but it can also be harmful. And what we have done together um, is to look at all the vaccines from that perspective, and we've started looking at live vaccines and non-live vaccines, and we have seen very consistently that the live vaccines, BCG, smallpox vaccine, and yellow fever vaccine, induce trained innate immunity. Non-live vaccines, in contrast, <coughs> induce tolerance. Now you may ask yourself, why didn't we look at measles vaccine uh, and DCP? And the problem is measles vaccine, we can't get to grow in the uh, uh, petri dishes and the DCP kills all the cells. So it's a, it's a little bit scary, but it's actually true. If you add the DCP down to the cells, they die. Uh, so so we can't, we, it's not all vaccines we can experiment on, but where we have been able to experiment, we have seen this consistent pattern. So we think there are fundamental differences in the general training of the immune system uh, between the live and non-live vaccines, and that may provide some clues as to why we see these differences on their mortality effect. 
Other groups are starting to work on this, and we are really pleased about that because one critique, as you saw, was that this is just a group working in Guinea Bissau, but now other papers are emerging showing non specific effects of BCG against hospitalization for respiratory infections and sepsis in Spain. So, another study from our part of the world, uh, also studies from Uganda coming out. Uh, so, so, there's increasing awareness which we are really pleased about and, and so happy about. So I'm reaching my conclusions here. Uh, state of the art is uh, vaccines have specific effects only. Nobody bothered to look for non-specific effects, and that might be why they were overlooked. That at least I believe uh, we have now a vaccine controversy. So immunological evidence support non-specific effects for live and non-live vaccines, and emerging immunological studies suggest that trained innate immunity may be uh, the reason. It was stormy weather when I left Copenhagen this morning. It's not too bad here, actually. <coughs> but I thought the weather forecast for our group is really more storms ahead. Uh, we had two very big battles. I have been focused for a lot of time on the battle, uh, the two different paradigms on vaccines. But I also think it's increasingly becoming a, 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 a discussion, a battle about different research methods also. Uh, patterns or p-values, Lagatos or Papa, call it what you want, but I, I think that's a battle we need to take on the road uh, to get through uh, with our ideas about vaccines. We might get some unexpected help from the outside, uh, and I'll just show, this is almost my last slide here, uh, that something unexpected happened in 2015 because um, GSK, a big pharmaceutical company and Gates Foundation, have worked for a long time on a malaria vaccine. Uh, it was published in Lancet 2015 that this vaccine had been tested in various African and Asian countries, and it had a clinical efficacy against clinical malaria of 18 to 36%. So it wasn't that much, to be honest. It was a little disappointing with a vaccine which protects 18 to 36%, depending on age group, but it was something. And, uh, and there was quite some optimism about that, and very rapidly, this was in April, in July 2015, the European Medicines Agency approved the vaccine uh, for, for use in younger children in Africa. So the expectation was that this would rapidly lead to a WHO approval and a launching of the vaccine in Africa without further ado. But our group, of course, couldn't resist looking into the mortality data. <coughs> in the paper, in the Lancet paper. They only presented overall mortality sort of in a, a few lines in the results section. They didn't put much emphasis on it. But when you read the paper, there was no protection against mortality. There was, in fact, 24% higher overall mortality in the vaccinated group. This was borderline significant. And coming back to significance, the authors wrote you know, a few lines about it. So it's a little, there wasn't the expected uh, in, in beneficial effect on mortality, but they didn't see any danger signal. Sounds very <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we, we asked in a letter in the Lancet in response to the first paper, we said, could you please provide the mortality data by sex because we could be worried and concerned that this covers a higher mortality in the females. This is a non-live vaccine, and we've seen this pattern with negative effects of non-live vaccines in females. The results came with six months delay, and, and I'll actually tell you the story, though I wasn't there because I wish I'd been there, because it was at the WHO, and I was in Korea, I couldn't be there, but some of my colleagues were there, and, and they were about to decide whether this malaria vaccine should be rolled out in the whole of Africa. And all the Africans were there, and they were saying, here was the vaccine, we want it implemented now. And then one of our friends in the board asked GSK if they could please prevent, present the data by sex. So they hadn't been released, and nobody had seen that data up to that date. So some woman from GSK comes up, and she places a, a, a piece on the... Uh, yeah, anyway, she shows the data, and it's just the crude number of deaths. It's not the, the not numbers or anything. It's just the crude number of deaths in the different groups. And an angel just walks through the room because it becomes quite clear that all the mortality are, is among females who receive the vaccine. And later on, the data was released on TSK's website, and we were able to, to publish a paper here uh, where we did all the calculations, and we can show that the malaria vaccine is associated with a small benefit on mortality in boys, but it's associated with highly significant twofold higher mortality in females. So it's the fifth in the row of five non live vaccines that we've found which is associated with increased mortality in females. And I think I can't I can't find any way to explain it other than there is a problem with these vaccines to females. WHO decided to postpone the, the launch of malaria vaccine to the great disappointment of many, but they decided they would test the findings in large trials. 
uh, and they're now making the preparations to include more than one million children during the next year's EU's trials. I have a big problem with that, and I think there's a problem in going and telling an African mother that she should participate in this trial, and she should let her little female enter this trial. But paradoxically, though I fear that this could be a catastrophe, I also think that it might be the thing that's needed to actually break uh, the, the glass ceiling and, and create real debate about non-specific effects of vaccines if, in reality, this turns out to be uh, the catastrophe that we predict it will be. So, um, yeah, our 2017 would be extremely exciting uh, since this is now the <laughs> new year, <laughs> first new year presentation here in, in 2017. I thought I would just take the opportunity to wish you all a very happy, uh, exciting, fruitful and prosperous 2017. And with that, I would like to thank all my collaborators in the Research Center uh, at the Gun Health Project in Open here at SDU, where I'm very happy to be affiliated, and of course also our funding sources. And then I would like to thank all of you for your attention. <laughs>
um, like up to here they're basically yeah. the same and then the beneficial effect kicks in yeah I think that's I, I um, I've seen other curves which don't have the same uh, breaking point and I think you just have to allow here for that this is epidemiological data it's recall data uh, and it can be difficult to, to, to directly pinpoint the time where it happened. We, it's something we definitely would like to look more into and also to the kind of, of experts that you were talking about, some more systems people in terms of, of, in terms of trying to disentangle from all the various studies where, whether we can define some time points and time periods which are more crucial than others. We aren't that far yet, but I just haven't seen any kind of convincing, uh, consistent pattern with regard to, to timing of events. And do you have any guides on what mechanism it could be given the sex specificity and given the, again, the high variability in the effect in itself among the different I think regions. the high variability is, is actually is something we need to, to combat or we need to deal with, but I think it's biological. I think, uh, as we also talk about, this system is an interacting system, so the idea that there's one effect, uh, it's, it's not going to hold up. So we just have to continue facing the challenge that the effects will be varying and we just need to try to see how far can we pull our, uh, can push our uh, definitions uh, and effects, and what are the defining um, conditions for the different effects? I don't think we can get rid of the variability. I think it's it's biological. Um, I, don't no, know. I, I, yeah. I don't think you need to get rid of it. Like mm. anyway, mm. it, it's more. I mean, I'm surprised how much variability among the different locations you see, not within the mm. location. So that either suggests like large genetic differences in the different studies, but then within Pinero Basau you still see very different responses between the different studies yeah. um, related to that. But yeah. Can I suggest to continue yeah. on this, there should be a much more in the discussion and maybe some I just have a, a quick question. You say this that uh, for this malaria study, the female mortality, you expect female mortality to double. How many people are we talking out of the million? Uh, 2,500 excess female deaths with the mortality levels that they predict in the areas where they will be working. So I, just in comparison, I don't know if you all know the expression of death from Lübeck. I, I think that comes from an incident where BCG was mistaken for tuberculosis and children were actually, instead of being vaccinated with BCG, they were vaccinated with tuberculosis. And 70 children, with a very high dose, I think, they were, 70 children died on that occasion, and that was like the biggest disaster to date uh, in relation to vaccines. So if you compare with that, 2,500 children are a disaster. Uh, uh, yeah. Any further questions? I have perhaps a little concern that you that you focus on, on uh, what a short period of study and on childhood mortality. For example, in relation to malaria, as I'm sure you know, we have this problem with uh, placental malaria, which affects not only the, the pregnant mother, but potentially also her infant. Mm -hmm. So could it be that some of the beneficial effects <coughs> of vaccination against malaria are overlooked when you just focus on childhood? No, in contrast, actually, because now the follow-up studies are coming out uh, after these uh, um, initial trials of the RTSS malaria vaccine and it seems that there is a problem with the immunity it induces because it wanes and actually malaria starts to increase again in the vaccinated group. Uh, so, so, so the fear <coughs> is that you actually you deliver immunity in a short time period where children would develop normal immunity so they don't get uh, naturally infected and, and after a while they will actually be worse off. So, so in addition to potential non-specific problems there also seem to be Adults, they can't continue this beneficial effect on malaria even um, into uh, older ages. Mm. But, but it's, it's clearly, I mean, it's one of the things we also would like to do is to continue to, and we can do that partly in our health and demographic surveillance, and to continue to do this long term surveillance because we shouldn't let go of following up. But I just think for to make meaningful comparisons of vaccines due to the interactions, we need every time we look at a specific vaccine to emphasize the period when it is the most recent vaccine, not closing our eyes from the fact that that things can change definitely over time and, and actually, yeah, may, may very well do so. Another question in the back. So you're saying that, um, that it's the latest vaccine which counts. Yes. So uh, 
really stupid question. Could you offset all the bad things by every time you have a bad vaccine follow up with a measles? Yes, I, I, I have such a good question. Um, <laughs> I, 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 you would think I had uh, asked him to ask exactly uh, that question. Because, of course, I have a little slide on that. And this is actually one I, I didn't have time to present it, but I hope somebody would ask because this is uh, some calculations which were made by an Australian pediatrician. And now I lost it. No. Yeah. So he actually said, if this is true, if we take this at face value, we have the current EPI schedule with a BCG at birth, three doses of DTP, measles vaccine at nine months, and then many countries give a DTP booster vaccine at 18 months. So in, in such a schedule, you will have DTP as the most recent vaccine for 50 of the first 60 months of life. So he, he just made an imaginary improved schedule and said, we emphasize in this schedule B to give BCG at birth. And then we give a measles vaccine shortly after the third uh, DTP, and we give a measles vaccine shortly after the booster DTP. And then he calculated that if our figures are really to be taken at face value, then such a schedule would reduce neonatal mortality by 30% from 3.2 million deaths to 2.2 million deaths per year, and mortality from one month to five years of age by 30%, corresponding to 1.5 million deaths per year. So a total of 2.5 million deaths per year. So that's. Uh, um, some quite dramatic figures if you if you believe in this uh, and uh, I, I can't say that we have proven it I just think we have indication sufficient indication to actually make it worthwhile to try to do proper randomized trials to see I mean this is this should be feasible to do a randomized trial comparing two such schedules I mean, with the with the with the ten birds on the roof of, of really catching such a big figure. Using Pascal's point of view, if it doesn't I mean at worst nothing happens. Yeah. So it, the people die in any case. So by doing it, you know, it's a win-win, right? Yeah. So you really don't lose more people. Right? Mm. Yeah. It can be bad to do it. <laughs> but there's one more question there. Yeah, I mean, I have to say I'm not an expert on this species, so it's yeah. a bit naive question. But you have been presenting data about uh, mortality of children. I was imagining that in Europe, as we have vaccines and more data, also there's a collective in hospitals about the infections. Mm -hmm. Would it be more useful to do a very extensive study in Europe to testing how many infections kids develop and the intensity of them and yeah. to get yeah. information? Yes. So we just submitted a, an application for, for funding together with the National Institutes of Health in Norway, Sweden and Finland to, to make a, a joint database of vaccine registers. The problem is Denmark is really far ahead uh, here because most other countries don't have that kind of vaccine registers. Uh, particularly in Germany, it's been it's completely impossible and, and other countries only came in quite late and, and many countries still have a problem with that kind of uniform registration of, of everything that we have in Denmark. But, the, but they're gradually coming and I think that's a, a very fruitful research area because actually it's surprising that even within Scandinavia we have quite different vaccination schedules for our children. So, so it should be possible to make some interesting communities. I would allow for one and maybe another more question and you can ask more questions. Um, Following up on the idea that, that, that we have an innate reminder uh, going on, or an innate just reminder depending on the uh, 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 stimulus, and that vaccination is a, is a uh, surrogate for uh, infection, uh, there could be a problem here historically, but would an epidemic uh, wreck uh, the, uh, the effect of vaccinations by skewing it suddenly for an entire population one way or another. I'm thinking, I'm actually being influenced in my thinking by some of Luke O'Neill's ideas about uh, imprinting, mm. um, for instance, uh, the, uh, the Black Death mm. has, has imprinted on mm. our population. Mm. Uh, 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 yeah, I think that's very reasonable. And I think that's, uh, I, I'm often asked if vaccines do this, wouldn't infections also just do the same thing to the immune system? And I basically think they do to a large extent. At least some infections will have that kind of imprinting effect also. For vaccinations, the, the beauty is that it's actually quite, it's a testable way of, of giving an infection. And, and it's widespread and it's quite strong. Yeah. Um, so that's why I said epidemic. Yeah. Something that actually yeah. sweeps yeah. the population. Yeah. yeah, I think that's absolutely a reasonable assumption that, that it could do that. But I think that might be a small difference with the vaccines that make them particularly uh, good at doing this kind of priming. And that is that we are interfering with nature's normal way of getting the infections. So we are actually, and, and especially I said for BCG and smallpox, those we give intradermally, we scratch them into the skin and, and, and they, um, 
they seem to have these very long-term uh, beneficial effects. So, so maybe the circumventing the what is normal entry points does add some kind of um, additional print imprinting value to the vaccines, but it's all speculated. But, but I definitely agree with your point that probably if we could picture all the infections that you have had during your life course, they would all have altered. We are all individuals and we are all, all a part of our, we are all a product of our infection history and, and it has defined us, I'm sure of that. So, since there have been quite a lot of questions, and uh, Christina was pretty good, and I'm pretty tough. Let me thank again Christina, let's thank again Christina. She's <laughs> really curious. Wow, thank you. To have scientists constantly questioning the, the, the status quo. This is actually every time you get a recurring report, which is not good. Can, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll uh, those. We all, I think you want to say that every one thing is to, uh, it's nice to always think that the rest. It's different from your field. It's the same. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, at most fields, you get the same. So, uh, every time you question the status quo, you yeah. have to be. You can come and have one. Oh, I know. <laughs> but again, thanks again. Thank and uh, and uh, uh, you all invited upstairs for uh, for some live things. Thank you.